Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, so we'll get into our next uh, presenter. Okay, so we have uh, Avi Rico and Ryan Fru from uh, McLean Engineering. So Avi Rico is a product manager of technology implementation at McLean Engineering. Mm -hmm. Avi is a professional engineer with the province of Ontario. He has a bachelor's degree in mine engineering and a master's degree in, in engineering from UQAT in Quebec. He has more than 11 years of experience in mining industry in different roles in North America, South America, Australia, and Europe. Ryan Pro is an account manager for McLean Engineering in the Sudbury region. Ryan is passionate about product development and offering innovative solutions to the mining industry. Ryan's current responsibilities include the management of Glencore's offering depth project, battery electric vehicle utility fleet. Ryan is an engineering graduate of Laurentian University and has worked in the mining industry for over 10 years, focused on mine design, mine planning, and business to business sales. So please welcome, welcome uh, Javi and Ryan. Thank you, Sam. So we're going to quickly talk. Uh, we're going to go over risk mitigation that we've put into consideration for our battery fleet. I'll start with some introduction to the company, some history and some product lines. Most of you will be familiar with McLean, but uh, for any who aren't, I'll start with a safety share. Uh, one of our electricians was just about to perform a live test on a 700 volt DC uh, bus when he noticed that his tool lead was slightly shorter on one side. Uh, at that time, he pulled the tool aside and noticed that the insulation was loose. And at, upon pulling on the insulation, he noticed the whole tool came apart. And at the position where his finger would have been on that rib grip, that, that's where it came apart. So there, there's definitely a, a risk that he could have been exposed to. Uh, our safety team right now is evaluating uh, what to do with this incident. Uh, we are inspecting all the tools that we have, but given that the length of the insulation <coughs> and the overlap um, were almost the same length, there may not have actually been a risk, but uh, it, it's a reminder to inspect your tools before starting the job. Okay. So, Quick overview, we're going to go over some news we're excited to share about, introduction of our equipment and technology, and then we'll jump into battery risk approach and our BV fleet. Uh, this year is our 50th year of operation. Currently have three manufacturing plants, two of which are in Ontario, one new and badly needed in Mexico. Uh, we secured two fleet sales this year, <clears throat> which we began delivering in 2023, and some of which we already have. Uh, one, the Honest and Depth fleet, which I'm presently working on. The other, Odyssey Mine. We have some people from Odyssey here today. And we expect to build a uh, plug 40 EVs this year. The company is founded in 73. Just in Southern Ontario, retrofitting mine tractors. The company has since grown to over a thousand employees and commissioned over 2,400 rigs. We have employees in four continents, six countries, and the majority of the company's experience is in the hard rock industry. Our fleet consists of mostly utility vehicles. Uh, the first group is primarily for services, logistics, and recently uh, road maintenance with the addition of a greater product. And we're also in the process of developing a forklift. 
The second line is bolting and shock free, primarily for reinforcement, construction, and uh, tunnel support. And then we have a product line which we call Orflow for uh, rock reduction size and hang up reduction. The critical technologies and things working on presently are uh, remote control systems, line of sight, video, and tele remote. And our telemetry offering is constantly improving with increased computing power and sensor feedback, which will be used for data analytics, both remote and the data is offered directly to customers should they choose to review the data themselves. We have lines of robotics under our new vehicle systems, where that division is implementing new application tools, um, new components, hardware, and a special notice here, I guess, to our a bolter that we're designing with a uh, robotic arm, which would be semi-autonomous and could be operated tele remote in the future. Um, and then our autom automation line, working on boom, intelligent boom operation, auto tram, uh, 3D scanning and mapping of underground uh, tunnels. Jumping into the meat of the potatoes of the presentation, um, the battery being the heart of our BEV rigs was positioned in the center of the chassis and all sub packs are enclosed in a custom steel structure. Uh, all connections within the battery are touch safe and ma managed by our battery management system that has multiple layers of redundancy and checking um, of circuitry. As discussed by Andy, um, the battery supplier we chose to work with is uh, Exalt. Exalt's done extensive testing on um, various uh, risk aspects, vibration, mechanical shock, thermal runaway, and ingress. Um, all of these tests meet ISO standards and international standards. Um, the list is quite extensive, given that it's meant for multi-countries. At the root of a safety tool that's available on most all of our BEV equipment, we have a telemetry offering. And all of the data that's fed from that system can be fed directly through to our portal, which would have uh, on-site monitoring remote. Also, the data could be fed directly to the customer in a raw format, which they are welcome to review and diagnose themselves. We're currently working on a system that would be 24 seven battery monitoring. The system is being developed with uh, our partners, Glencore. Uh, the intent is to be able to catch any type of maintenance or service re requirement, even when operators are not present. I'll hand the next <laughs> part over to Javier. Okay. Uh, thank you, Ryan. So, in, yeah. Um, as uh, some say, I'm uh, working in uh, uh, implementation of technology. So for us, telemetry is the most important part. We need to know what's going on all the time. What's going on inside of the battery? The battery is performant, it's not performant. You can see it, they have a screen, so uh, the operator can see what's going on at any point. That data goes to our portal, and the portal can be uh, uh, we can be uh, engine by any place at uh, any time. So management can see if something is going wrong and we have control of the situation. Like where, and, uh, before Andrew was talking about, if something happens, before if something happens, we will know, the operator will know and everybody will aware. So it's not, we're gonna have a, an emergency if everybody looks at the screen. So we have the emergency, we have signs, we have visual. So it's up to everybody to be do their part for safety when you're operating an equipment. So from the perspective, is like I was saying, we have the system that's going on going uh, on board the diagnosis uh, that has a warning and uh, remote machine and monitoring of the system. So what is my claim? We were talking about technology, how we're talking about training, 
was part of uh, the risk. So, and, and as part of the standard guidelines, we participate in the GMD VEV of the third revision. So, it's what is used for most of the industry to know exactly how to deal with battery battery equipment. We will work with all the OEMs and mining companies to be sure like hey, all the inputs are there so we have a baseline of what you should be aware of. Uh, we're talking about uh, updating the CSA standard. We will we'll discuss by team, by uh, team, oh, sorry, by Tom. And uh, clearly we're seeing uh, we sign accordance with the VBS standard so we have an approach of safety. So what my claims uh, view on risk assessment? We do a full risk assessment from design, uh, general assessment for operational, a full time app, functional safety analysis, and management of change. That all of you are aware that is part of you know, any, any new project you should do. So, in the case of uh, general risk assessment for operational risk, I'm sure all of you have been working with mining companies or even in your own company, you have to go through all of them in different areas. From breakdowns, going through operation, maintenance, pre op check, everything is part of your day, up, day by day, has to be. So that's where the, my claim is about safety. So the ball type, and we were talking about what is the risk, one of the, the, the ones we talk about, the high voltage, yes, uh, they are, the third circuit, everybody's okay, I can't touch this, I cannot touch it. It's that kind of thing that we, we are scared because we don't know, but we have the tools. To actually know what's going on. And of course, thermal runaway that everybody say, well, what happened? Something happened like that. Well, like I said before, we have uh, the telemetry. You need to pay attention to what the machine is telling you. So you're going to write it up and you don't have to worry about an emergency. That's the most important thing. In the case of safety layers, uh, we go from the battery cell, the modes of parts assembly, the vehicle itself, and communications and our many controls that we pay attention of them. So there is a little bit a small bit one, but I'm going to explain like as much as I can what you see. Um, so in this case of safety layers, we have uh, software, hardware, and uh, the testing procedure. So we go from the uh, from the cell safety layer. We start with actually being really aggressive at that point. That when they ask uh, a song that be really do uh, um, uh, say abuse the battery and the salts. So we sure when we receive that, we are happy with the product and we can give it to the clients. So we start with the safety layers. Uh, we start with uh, fire. Fire retardants, we're talking about a, a, what type of uh, material they use. So we sure that is a, a, the perfect combination for the battery vehicle. In the case of uh, battery mode and safety layers, when we put everything together, so we need to know, and uh, Andrew was talking, how it communicates, uh, <coughs> sub sub packs, they, they put it together, they know each other, so if something goes wrong, something goes down, and the rest, they behave like they're themselves connected. So again, we are, uh, I would say, uh, abuse <coughs> the testing, like what we do, we need to be sure that the battery is gonna be fit for purpose. And we again on the on the uh, on the safety model we talk about but a fire retardant. So we worry about what's going to happen if something happens. We have to have control. So when we put everything together, when the uh, the part of the hardware goes together, you have the brains of the battery pack to pack. So that brains talk knows exactly what's happening in each in each battery to pack. So if something happens, telling you to the VMS, and that's the reason we push the uh, the telemetry because at that point anything happens that brain is turned to our system like hey some battery is not working or the peak is going up or the anything the heat is going over the limits you know exactly what's going, what's going on in any in any moment so at that when all of that we receive the battery from salt we know the battery is uh is uh after standard and came to us well, we came to us, we'll go and we abuse of the battery ourselves as our AM to be sure like everything is, okay, they told me that's good. Okay, I'm gonna believe you, but well, I don't believe you. Let's do it properly again and test everything to be sure like we are on the same page. So we do testing, we monitor all the, pro all the protocols. Uh, we have the internal controls, the e-stops, 
when we're talking about uh, uh, fire, uh, when we're talking about ASUL, we have all those systems in place. It's only happened. The equipment is ready for everything. And that's when you go to the vehicle safety layer and say, again, everything is inside the vehicle. We, we did the, uh, the, the year stop, the ASUL, and everything I was talking about. So, administrative controls. There is like something like we take for granted or we have our own controls. Well, it's a new technology, so we have to think how this technology can affect our, our standard procedures. It's different. You cannot be here from one or the other. It's different technology, different way of, of work with that technology. So in the case of something happened, let's say we have underground and we have a beer, the, the system, our telemetry is telling you, hey, one of these batteries is, is like too high. One of the uh, so Pax is not doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, well, you know what? We we'll go there, stop the system, we we'll go there, we're gonna get it, and we get this beautiful red box that's from the military that you can put weapons there. We don't do that, but just yes, in case you want to do it. Uh, and you just connect it and has some brain that is telling you it's completely isolated for any kind of connection. So you only can see what's going on at that point there. And that red box can be uh, uh, put in, in an airplane if you need it. So it's that area of technology that you can manage and you cover with everything there and it's connected so it keeps the temperature so you're safe. And that's the worst case scenario. We have to go there. If, if we have to see something from telemetry, you can stop it and you're good. Well, in case of uh, response, are we talking about towing? Here's our towing procedure that we developed. And again, you just follow the procedure that it is. Uh, like uh, uh, Andrew was saying, you're not gonna be towing that thing at 20 kilometers an hour. You're gonna go really slow. And also the thing you want is like, uh, take it with really care because it's an EV machine. That means it's more pieces that you don't know how they're gonna be able that queer movement. So you just take it care with any other machine and you bring it to the shop and so, and the guys can work on that. And you're safe. So what else? We have uh, we have uh, in collaboration with our customers and most of you guys here, we develop emergency response cards uh, for underground emergency and it's part of our safety training. So that we were saying before and Tom we said is training, collision, and as that's the word people as well. We try to push as much as we can on training, on knowledge. Everybody needs to be aware how that works and how you manage if something doesn't go like you're expecting. So, you know, okay, something is not, the telemetry is telling me something should be there. There's no, what is the procedure? So I know exactly what to do. So it's no, it's no risk. And of course, you've been with the training team, uh, it's important that the people who work with you have the qualifications and they know the job. And again, <clears throat> we're discussing that now it's a new technology. So maybe the way you used to do things is not the same way now. So you have the qualification, but now you have to have a, a mechanical electrician, a mechanical electrician. You need to have both things together because that's what the machine is need for you. So you need to work on your team, is, is prepared and know exactly what they're doing. So uh, we were talking about our type of body. And in our case, we use a lot of conductive tool and to improve the, the, the battery design. The reason is, is uh, we saw in the early uh, EV batteries internal design, increasing the risk of internal RP. So we introduced the low conductive uh, cooler to reduce that inner risk. So, uh, from, that, from that point, we saw that uh, the improvements on the design are reduced that risk. And we now, if a client wants to do that type of cooler, we have, we sit on the table and say, okay, that's the kind of cooler you can use. If you don't use it, we're gonna know because the system is gonna tell you, it's gonna have a peak on there. Yeah, I have a peak up here. That's telling you, for example, it will show you the rest. It's something wrong, you put the wrong cooler. You don't do it in your car at home. You're not gonna wanna do it in a VEP. Mm -hmm. So just to be aware, like you need to use the proper apart from tool, the proper uh, uh, you know uh, liquids and everything for a VEP. 
Anyway, we'll go to the service layers. And that is something we also discussed. Who can touch a beam? <laughs> so if you have all your team uh, well trained, we'll be like, who can use a multimeter, who can use a who can uh, for zero or for zero energy can check, and then what are the different steps? So for maintaining that is for the battery to pack, uh, for the uh, battery is going to unit is only us we can do that. It's uh, and we're talking about leasing, about binding. Well, if you buy the battery, we will teach you how to do it. But if you lease that, well, uh, was saying, most of the clients, if you're not, you deal with that. You're the specialist, and you do for us. So here is just basically a, a different areas like when you go to the soup pack, when you go to the battery, when you go to the vehicle. So we split on where you should be touching and we should not touch it. So, and after all this, of course, when we give you an agreement, we have to do a commissioning and we really uh, are focused on the energized inspection testing. So we know everything is there. It's not, it's not a risk for everybody. It's safe and it's what you ask for. And everything is really stationary or mobile in our gas. So we know it's moving, it's not risk, it's there, it's not risk. Everything is working as it's supposed to. And again, I was talking about uh, skills and training. We have a, a portal, a McLean Academy, and it's for uh, any kind of operators, mechanical, electrical, uh, good base. And we've, we focus that training according with the client needs. We have our um, specialists to develop the training according to what is your, your need. If we have different clients and we're developing that according, it's not the same on electrician in, in, for example, in South America and in, in Canada. An electrician in, in South America can do anything. Here we have different levels. So a different type of things you need to learn and you need to be aware. So uh, right now we have uh, also a, a virtual reality simulator. And I know the cool things that I'm part of that. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty happy with those. And that's what it is. Is uh, The most important thing is you know what it is and you feel comfortable when you approach a machine. No, you don't look like, no, no, I don't want to touch that. No, no. You need to feel comfortable with that because you're going to be working. If uh, we always learn like when, uh, uh, if somebody's gonna turn off a pan, they write the, the, the roll of the hand and get out of the way. Well, you need to apply common sense and know exactly that. For that, we have training specific so you know exactly what to do at any time. Mm -hmm. Also, in summary, uh, so the safety systems continue to mature as uh, the BEV are deployed. Mm -hmm. So anything is getting better the batteries, the performance, uh, the training, the technology. So, but it's like we were saying, it's not the same a phone 10 years ago that the phone developed on the table. Everything is evolving to uh -huh. so evolve, and we we want everybody is aware of everything, so everybody everything is safe. And to be um, successful, what we think is like understanding the potential risk, I can say, how to mitigate them, a continuous improvement for everybody, for us in our technology, for you understanding the technology and putting it in place. Uh, training, training, training. Uh, sorry, I, I know it doesn't like nobody likes to work because uh, it means your guys are not on the face <clears throat> or doing what they're supposed to be doing for their pain for, but you need them to be aware of and be trained. That's the most important part. Uh, so if you love the BB, are you ready? That would be the question. Are you ready for all the management of chains, all the change of mentality, all the training? Yeah, well, we know the benefits is better that uh, PV are better than diesel in so many ways, but we have to be prepared for that. Uh, that's it. Um, if somebody has any questions, I'm just filling up for Alex. But, uh, for what he was an emergency, so. Uh, so any questions for the questions that the one I'm not gonna answer here, please feel free to Ryan or Ali. Thank you. Any uh questions for Ryan or Roger? So, sure. I'm just curious, uh, now that you're kind of the second uh, OEM speak, if uh 
everybody's following the same standard. Like for underground equipment, for a lot of it, we follow uh, M421 with CSA approval. Uh, does anybody notice a gap for for anything for, for battery electric vehicles and CSA? Uh, we right now, like we said, we're working with CSA on, on those standards. We all was approached by uh, by Comet and they wanted uh, by the federal government to see how they can help to do to do all the testing. So we're working with them because, like we said, it's not something there. And only everybody wants to have something, so it's easy to at least know where, where we're going. Okay. Okay. Uh, Kathy, question? We have a few coming in online. Yeah. Um, Kathy, you in the service model of battery support, is there a calibration schedule for a deployed battery as some of the service functions are by McLean employees only? What is that schedule like? That is according to the client. So we usually when we do the maintenance, the, the PM, we go there to check everything on the on the on the, on the equipment. That's all works. Okay, uh, another question in house. Okay, so we have another one online. Um, does McLean BMS systems include gas sensors for battery vent gases? That is the same question as Andre. Uh, uh, I'm not aware, like, we deploy gases inside of the, of the battery to pack that uh, would be like really interesting to see. And maybe Andre can use one of your simulators and show us how gas come out. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Thanks. Um, next question online. Uh, have any McLean vehicles experienced thermal runaway in the field? If so, can you describe those events? Um, I don't think I have the um, power, not the power, but it's, it's, it's an internal situation in the mind, so I cannot disclose any information about that. No worries. Um... Is actual energy consumed kilowatts per hour by each vehicle available to the end user? Yeah, you can uh, you can take uh, the VMS is reading how much energy you're putting in and out of the system. So basically, you measure like if you're in standby or if you are on auxiliary mode, and you're like basically what you're taking from the net, from the uh, from the grid. And it's often continually measuring the battery's internal resistance, which is an indicator of the white space battery for emission. Um, right, Kathy. Uh, so we have one here. Question. We're saying your connectors were touch safe. Do you have any interlock like the underrepresented that disconnects battery power? Or how do you prevent people from touching it? Uh, what's your touch safe system? Uh, yeah. We know we have it, and honestly, that's a question from Alex there. That's uh, he's a the person. He's a, a really a uh, on field guy, started like that, so he knows exactly hands on. I can tell you the, on the general part. I cannot specifically answer that question at this point. And my other question was: Do you have any energy like down mode when the battery is fully loaded and you're going down the ramp? Uh, like yeah, here's up uh, when it does stop. Second, uh, stop taking the energy in that dissipate. That dissipates through a heater element. In the yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the BMS will tell you, okay, this is enough, and it start to dissipate the energy. Say, so like, this is not what I need. Okay. Uh, Gavin, another yeah, we have a uh, question about training. Are the trainings for the technicians all set up and ready to go? Do you collaborate with training centers to bring training to schools? We have an uh, agreement with Cameron College, and we actually train them on the battery. They come to our facility in uh, McGill, and we train them how to deal with battery. So that's the beginning of the whole cycle. And if this is a class specific client, we basically <coughs> sit with them and see what they need according to what, what, how they, they train people. And we're nearly done developing a training program that's specifically to new fleets that are releasing. <laughs> Okay. Uh, any other questions? Right here. Not so much on safety, but um, do you guys have or are developing the energy consumption charts? So, like, so much every rock scout and like so speed and ramp radiance and kilowatt hour usage loaded and unloaded kind yeah. of stuff. Do you have yeah. that? Yeah, we have that. Well, basically, we see if the equipment is strong when it's strumming, when it's stop, when it's standby, when it's opportunity for charging, that we always say, like, you charge it, but oh, charging, you're just maybe. Uh, loading on a loading something 
just putting you're filling the gas tank. So we have that for the clients and they decide whatever they want to see. We also have enough field data that we could probably give um, actual examples from yeah. real data if requested. It'd be good for building energy models. Okay. Uh, Gabby, any... Someone asked, can the speaker advise this OEM's adopted battery chemistry and why this one was selected? Well, I think that you will explain really, really well about why it's the most performance, safe, and all uh, the whole package. That's the reason we choose that one. We use NMC. <clears throat> okay. uh, questions? Love some yeah. online. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Any plans for BEVs approved for gas fee mines? That's just a long way to go. Let's let's start with metallic mines and everybody up in this room and we will go another another area. <laughs> that one, Gabby. Uh, can you elaborate on the change of battery supplier from Acasol to Salt? <laughs> well, which we is because was better performance and we saw uh, the, the way Axel was abusing the batteries to be sure they safe is was much better. Axel's value is greater alignment than playing this call. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Gabby? No, I think we're we've gotten through them online. All right. So well, thank you very much. <laughs> So, Brian and uh, let me just a little appreciation. Thank you very much. So, our next presenter, so if this is done uh, virtually, so Mike Mayhew uh, couldn't be here, but uh, he will be doing uh, his presentation uh, virtually. So hopefully, uh, <laughs> it's like no wonder he couldn't come in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think he asked anybody in the room to go with him, right? <laughs> so, um, so our next presenter is Mike Mayhew. Mike is a subject matter expert, battery technology with over 30 years of mining experience. He worked with all major mining companies around the world by providing the expertise and hands on experience. In evaluating the business case for battery electric vehicle versus diesel, including preparing mining companies to implement battery electric vehicles within their operations. He was a key uh, pioneer in developing the world's first 40 ton battery electric truck, the Z40, and operating at the Macasa mine. Uh, Mayu Performance Limited is currently engaged in many battery electric vehicle projects worldwide, working with global clients provide technical and operational expertise. So like I mentioned, uh, Michael will be presenting virtually. Uh, he'll let you know where he is. And please welcome uh, Mike. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon or morning, I guess, depending on where you are in the country. Um, can you see my screen, everybody? Yeah. Yes. Good. Yeah. All right, good. So nice to see uh, the, the project, uh, the uh, WSN again. I just I want to kick off with uh, just a special thank you to uh, Mike Perrin and WSN and uh, for their leadership and, you know, their commitment to battery safety. And this has been going on, I believe, three years young. And I started to look back, which I'll talk about a little bit where we started, but also to Sam and the whole crew at the WSN. Um, you know, thank you for carrying this uh the torch and carry it on and I'm seeing some progress and hopefully we see some more progress in battery electric vehicles as we continue to move forward. You know, the presenters that presented this morning on risk, uh, you know, the OEMs that also presented uh, before me, and uh, obviously I'm gonna talk a little bit about the reality of, OE of uh, operational readiness and implementation. As uh, Sam read my bio, I think uh, I'll share a couple of lessons learned and you know some things to consider as we continue to move forward in battery electric vehicles. Um, to my team, of course, there's a couple uh, members on online virtually. Uh, we decided to uh, enjoy a little bit of heat rather than the cold. So uh, we're on the other side, uh, we're in North America working out of our US office. Uh, but nevertheless, I wanted to be in Sudbury for this conference because I always enjoy 
this conference and be in person, but just we couldn't make it logistically work. So to my team again, and to uh, most importantly to to my mentors, uh, Tony McCooch and also Vern Cameron for uh, allowing me to live my dream and uh, pushing me to the extreme in this this section and this battery technology and uh, green energy. So um, a couple of things that I want to talk about, uh, you know, the reality of the implementation of battery electric vehicles. I'm going to really take a deep dive into operations and I'm going to take a, a deep dive on what is the next level of where we're heading and what we're doing and, you know, getting prepared to implement. So we always usually start with a safety share, but I would like to um, talk about every slide that I'm going to show today is a safety share in my opinion, because we're dealing with people underground, we're dealing with new technology, um, we're dealing with, you know, um, risk, but in battery electric vehicles, we can manage and maintain risk, but we just need to understand the hazards, but more importantly, we got to educate. And, you know, I heard several people this morning, including three years ago, I remember Glencore and Steve Omick and Mr. L.A. Landry talking about, we need to do more in colleges and universities. Um, and, you know, uh, from that comment three years ago, I remember quite frankly, that's where, you know, Cambrian College kicked in and also uh, Collège Boreal. And now we have Northern College. I was heavily involved with Collège Boreal uh, to take that program. And, um, you know, that's going to be the cornerstone, but that's only one piece. The OEMs are doing their part and there's other people like myself that are subject matter experts that are out there with some operations experience that can continue to educate, you know, making sure that, you know, that people understand the benefits, the features and the performance of battery electric vehicles. But more importantly, when it comes to maintenance and electrical, what are the hazards and the risk? including the operations, but also to the OEMs. But don't forget, there's a lot of people that go underground for tours, that could be shareholders, investors, that could be suppliers, that could be, you know, students. So it's a big shift. Um, the industry is shifting, regardless if we like it or not. And I'll talk a little bit about that and I'll share uh, as much as I can without jeopardizing any NDA. We're working with only mining clients around the world. And the other thing that uh, I like to share is the data and the information I'm going to share is very generic. I will not talk about OEMs. I, uh, Mayu Performance does not build equipment. That's not what we do. Uh, what we do is we stay in the at the high level, working on the owners team with the operations, helping them make a decision from a financial standpoint, safety standpoint, of course. Then after making sure that it fits the mine design and the mine plan then we get involved in execution and operational readiness. So with that said, um, a little bit about the truck. You can see here, this is me in 2018 at Macassa Mine on 5600 level. Uh, this uh, truck was the first 40 ton truck built in the world. Uh, we built that with our partners. Uh, with uh, Back in those days, it was Artisan. I was part of that um, group in those days and 2017 and 2018, we launched this truck underground. But I wanna go back to safety again, because this is what the mission is of this conference. It's all about safety. And why was this truck built? Obviously, Mikasa had a need because of the heat uh, depth, but more importantly, what they wanted to do is they wanted to be able to, uh, to increase their production, but also, you know, take safety into consideration and also reduce their DPMs, which is diesel particulate matters. So uh, I sat in uh, Toronto with my mentor, Tony McCooch, and he said, what do you wanna do, Mike? I said, I'd like to build a first truck, a 40 ton truck. And he says, why? I said, because my father, my stepfather worked at Valet or Inco back in those days, 30 years. And basically, um, he retired and he was going to continue to do a, a journey and travel and see the world with my mom. Unfortunately, six months later, he passed away uh, with cancer. <clears throat> There's definitely a lot of impact when we're all hit with cancer. But the key message here I'd like to share with you, I think, and I have no facts, but I got to believe that in underground mining with diesel in particular, and uh, that it had an impact on his lungs and definitely had an impact on his short life expectancy. With that said, 
very within the last six months, a very close family member within my range um, was diagnosed with cancer, a throat cancer. Uh, same thing applies. Uh, worked with him at uh, Macassa Mine, and basically, you know, um, he's going through treatment. He's going to be okay. He's 54 years old. Um, he's going to fight through it. Thank God we have good technology, good uh, good research, and also good doctors. But he spent three months back in in Montreal. So my message to all of this is that you know, in my mission is that if we can eliminate diesel particulate matters in underground mining, then we've accomplished what we needed to do. However, I need to say, and I'll be the first to say, that battery electric vehicles for the operation is not the key answer for all mining companies because of a business case and there's a pile of different scenarios that you have to take into consideration. But what I can say to you that if we look at the companies that are looking to go green, that have a commitment to sustainability and to continue to push towards taking care of health and safety for their employees, they're going to highly consider battery electric vehicles in underground mining, regardless of the capex. Uh, of uh, what that looks like. And we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll leave a lot of room at the end uh, about, you know, questions, because I'm sure there'll be a ton of questions. So that's kind of the, the opening statement, a little long winded, but I wanted to give you kind of some uh, some comparisons and give you a history. Um, I just learned probably about seven months ago, this truck is called Rosie. When we implemented it in 2018, we built it in one year. Rosie survived for four years at the Macassa mine, and I'm very thankful for Kirk and Lake Gold for doing and living my dream with me and pushing that. Ian is that uh, Rosie was one of the parts that really made the shift in the industry, pushed all the OEMs uh, to go to the next level with bigger vehicles, and you know here we are today. So I'm pretty excited about that and. Uh, you know, Rosie now is on surface and I believe uh, he's no longer on site, but uh, it was a journey. And, uh, you know, I'm very proud of uh, where Rosie got to take us and where we're going to continue to go. All right. So next uh, next slide. So long introduction about me, performance. I'm give you a, just a quick snapshot. Safety and mines operation, BV awareness and risk and hazards and fizz. I want to talk about production because really, you know, that's where the rubber meets the road and making sure that, uh, you know, what's going on in the production and how it gets ready for, you know, preparation of underground when we really get into the real operation. The BV engineering design, the charging methodology, I, I heard some questions on that. Then some of the lessons learned in the case studies that I'll share with you, they're very generic. I'm under, like I said, under NDA with all our clients, we do a lot of these. Then the next step and the next phase is operational readiness. So this is perfect timing in the uh, in in this discussion about safety. So again, safety is always keeping in mind. A little bit about our team. Uh, I won't read through this. I think you can all read. Um, but this is kind of the the niche market that we kind of dive into, and we support the industry. Uh, we work with uh, all OEMs. Uh, to be uh, to validate, to consider, to get the technical data, and then make sure it applies to the right mining application, regardless if it's base metals or precious metals or, or potash. And the key thing is uh, when we started this business in the heart of COVID in 2020, um, the goal was that we would be agnostic to the industry and that we would continue mm -hmm. to prove facts and basically you know, provide clients with recommendation on path forward. We do not get into in, involved as well as uh, when it comes to procuring. We kind of remove ourselves from that last transaction because we want the client to pick the right OEM based on the analysis and based on, on performance. So a little bit of my background. Uh, again, um, as I mentioned, uh, I was able to build the truck from principal design in one year, which was a major challenge, but what a great opportunity, lots of learning. Um, then have to bring it down the shaft and operate it. I believe I'm the only person in the world so far that's ever done that from principal design to manufacturing, to bringing it down the shaft, to operating uh, the vehicle. 
So I was able to touch all aspects of it in a very short period of time. Um, also, too, I managed the mine at Mikasa, which uh, we at that time during my tenure, we had 42 pieces of equipment, which was a mix of battery electric vehicles. For those that are interested in the mix, it started off with the RDH, uh, the Iparoc. Back in those days, it was Atlas Copco, the ST7, and the MT2010s. Then we graduated to the uh, the Artisan Z, uh, the Artisan A4, which is a uh, small loader, now Sandvik, and the Artisan Z50, uh, Z, Z50, which was uh, again the first truck that went down the ramp and then after that's all Sandvik today then eventually we stuck into uh, just into the production equipment at that mine but the mission was at that time that we were going to transition to a full battery fleet but uh, that just never happened for whatever reason so like I mentioned uh, we founded Mayhew Performance in 2020 uh, we specialize uh, when people ask me well Mike what's your secret sauce I, I like to say that you know where we really hit the impact is the front end study and then after we actually put the numbers together then after where the most important part for me and and I say this all the time um, you know buying the equipment's the easy part it's the execution and implementation and training is the critical part of the success of the program. And why I say that folks is because is that the OEMs are providing great products out there. There's good technology, it's evolved over the last four years and I can talk a lot about it in different OEMs. I'm not going to mention the OEMs because I want to be agnostic, but the technology is rapidly changing. OEMs are adapting uh, from a performance. People have mentioned it already, you know, on batteries, they're switching battery users there's reasons for that chemistry of course is one and the second one is obviously performance and reliability and service so that's really really critical for the long sustainability for for the operation and i heard somebody talk about battery as a service as well that was an excellent question um kudos to whoever asked that question because that's going to be another important development over time um, then after the last thing, I guess, you know, I spend a lot of time in battery. I've been watching this for the last 12 years and operating. So why BEV? Let's talk about that again. Of course, why the conference? Again, uh, WSN, you know, puts on this conference with industry experts, all of us in the room, including online, so we can share the knowledge, the experience, but also bring it together. And how do we continue to evolve and learn and grow? and put in guidelines and policies to ensure the safety of everybody. I, I like uh, the first presenter, um, you know, he talked about three things, you know, he talked, well, he talked about many things, but he talked about the top 10, you know, risk factors and, you know, it continued to come back and I, I wrote them all down. I got them here on my piece of paper, but arc flash, arc flash, arc flash, arc flash, 50% of the overall risk was in arc flash. If we look at the numbers and just do the calculation, I am an engineer, so I do that. Um, the next one, you know, second on his list was training and collision and, and so on. The point being is that they're all the same. So how do we as industry adapt and, you know, execute, but give confidence and continue to expand on those risks to ensure that nobody does get hurt or killed? in mining regardless if it's a battery electric vehicle or a diesel that's number one so why health and safety and what's that critical and what's the impact well if you anybody that goes underground we all know that if you go underground in a diesel um a diesel mine and you come back up and you blow your nose you can see what the color is pretty quick now flip it and go into battery electric vehicles in the same scenario and blow your nose you'll see a huge difference I'll give you, I give you all the challenge the next time you go underground. And there's more to it to that, than just that. Then the other reason why BEV is net zero commitments. What does that mean? Well, what does it mean? It means that, you know, maybe it's a GHG initiative from corporate, or maybe they want to reduce their carbon footprint and, or they want to just eliminate DPMs. Now think about the DPMs in an underground mine, depending on the equipment and the horsepower, what that really puts people in jeopardy. So there's trade-offs, but I call battery electric versus diesel. Then your ventilation network. What does that do to your ventilation work network more importantly? So there, there's a cost to overall assume that, but 
what is the cost for keeping people safe and 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 also a good working environment. And now I can share a story when I was at Mikasa when we pushed battery electric vehicles, some of the operators hated the battery electric vehicles until they understood how to operate them and basically how to manage the batteries and charging. But then there became a time that we had a mixed fleet, a hybrid fleet, that we had to put them back on the diesel. They would tell the captain to say, I'm not going back on a diesel. I'm going to continue to drive the battery electric vehicle because one, it's quiet. I don't have heat. You know, I, it's no vibration. It's faster and stronger. So these are the things that, you know, the operation started to adapt slowly. And I'm talking four years ago. So here we are in 2022 uh, or 2023, sorry. And, and uh, things continue to evolve and there's more benefits to it. And the ability to, to mine at depth, the heat, the cooling and the ventilation. So from my end, you know, when I woke up every morning as the mine superintendent, the first thing that I would go into our captain's meeting at five o'clock in the morning was, are we working safe and is there any incidents? That was number one. And then next is first aids, near misses and medical aid. And believe it or not, some are reported, some are not. So we encouraged people to do that. We wanted, we set up a time, we set up a card that we wanted to get the reports. And the only way we knew that the industry or we would learn more about battery technology is continue to get input from the operators and the staff and the people so we can put mitigation strategies together so we can make sure that nobody gets hurt. Then, you know, our SOPs followed, or do we even have SOPs in this case? And I heard some policies and procedures, and believe it or not, we don't, in some cases, don't have them. Clients are asking about them all the time. Then what's the impact when you know you're blasting with battery equipment and remote mucking from surface, for example, or you know if you're breaking through a hole in underground and with battery equipment. So again, observation cards, understanding, auditing, then hazard recognition program where we're providing positive feedback and we're sharing those learnings with the crews every day. So a little bit of a you know comparison for those that are. And a lot of people already know this, but, you know, I like to kind of just, it's a different way of thinking. You know, the conventional diesel, we don't have an engine anymore. We don't have a torque converter. We don't have, you know, oils. We do have hydraulic oil, but we don't have regular oil or filters. It's a different way. Now we're, we flip to inverters, electric motors, batteries. There was a lot of technical questions around the battery management, which was fantastic as well as inside the cell, under the cover, I call it. You know, how does it, how does it, do we have fire suppression systems in there? So these are all great questions, but there is a difference and it's a different way of thinking and we have to prepare accordingly when we get ready for the next phase of operational readiness. So let's talk about the hazards, you know, and there's many more hazards, but I just identified a few hazards here just so people can see. The electrical, of course, you know, 50%, I go back to the first slides, you know, was arc flash. So that falls into that little section, you know, large batteries we're dealing with, depending on the OEM, we can be dealing with big batteries, we can be dealing with small batteries, we can be dealing with packs, we can be dealing with cells. Um, you know, during my tenure, we used to manage that. Uh, I highly recommend nobody does that moving forward is that we allow the OEMs to do what they do best is manage the batteries and also take care of all the batteries uh, since they are the experts and they're close to their battery suppliers. Then, you know, the loss of power, I heard Andy talk about that uh, today as well. If you lose power, what does that look like? You know, then, uh, you know, the, the one uh, I always say the cat in the bag is the fires. Nobody wants to really talk about fires, but we know there's fires out there and we've talked about them and kudos to Glencore um, for sharing their learning and kudos to McLean for sharing their learning. And I'm going to talk about another one today that I'll mention uh, the fire. It's public information, but I cannot get into any of the uh, details. But for those that are that are familiar, there's three battery fires thus far that have been reported and potentially maybe some that have not been reported that I'm not aware of, but I'm usually aware of them. So usually this is Nicole that does this. Nicole's a, a health nurse. She's a registered nurse. She worked at the shaft with me. Uh, she just talks about, you know, what the impact can be if 
we touch a battery and what are the safety standards. So, you know, I don't want to dive too much into details here, but this is from an occupational health and safety standpoint, and it calls the experts. So for those that are interested more in details around this, I suggest you reach out to uh, Paige and or anybody within WSN and they can get in contact with, uh, with Nicole. So talking about fires, again, uh, you know, the Borden, uh, McLean's already done a root cause analysis and they've actually shared their, uh, their learnings and they've adapted, uh, you know, some protocol and safety uh, procedures to ensure that that doesn't happen again. And again, uh, they were the first pioneers to really, and I believe it was Dave Jakes that uh, shared that in either the first year or the second year. Uh, my memory is getting a little, uh, I'm getting a little older folks. So, but uh, again, the point being is that, you know, McLean took the initiative to share their learnings and their and their and their understanding so they can educate the industry. So to me, that's just a, a leader in this industry to continue to do stuff. You know, it's always good to share the good news, but you know, sometimes we have to learn from I won't call it the bad news, I'll call it the opportunities to learn so that way we never put people in jeopardy and keep people safe. Second one, uh, Glencore. I I seen Steve and uh, a few others inside uh, on online here. So kudos to Glencore for sharing that experience as well. Um, at the same thing, they did this, I believe, at the last uh, WSN, and they've shared their uh, learnings with all mining companies. So they they weren't secretive. Uh, they uh, they shared that and they got feedback and they put some procedures and processes in place you know, as they continue to evolve. And we all know that uh, Glencore is going to be a mine of the future at the Anaping Deep, which is fully battery electric. So that's really exciting news there. But my point to all this is that, uh, you know, again, mining companies and OEMs are sharing their knowledge and their experience. The third one is Bear Gold, uh, Turquoise Ridge. There was a battery fire in during, during transportation. That's all I can say on that one. Um, but again, logistics becomes very, very important. Managing your logistics, either from a ramp or a shaft, how you transport batteries from surface to underground needs to be part of your operating procedure and also educating and training even the people that are handling it. Just don't think about the operators and the, and the mechanics and the, the, uh, the electricians. There's more to it. So these are all critical components that we need to continue to ensure. Then the last thing I just want to talk about fire, how do we handle fire, right? I heard that question as well. And depending on the chemistry and mine rescue has a different approach. Um, from my perspective, you know, again, depending on what the, the, um, the chemistry is going to dictate, you know, how you're going to fight the fire. And when I was operating the mine, we also did fire drills, including I was caught at one time at 1.30 in the morning with a battery electric fire which was at the time I didn't know when I got the call. And if anybody is operated, when you get a call anytime after 12 o'clock, it's like, holy, I'll say shit. And it's not a good feeling. And I have family that worked at Mikasa. And regardless, I had 450 family members that were working underground that I wanted to make sure that they got home safe. My point to that is that we ran scenarios. We ran with my rescue so we can always keep people sharp in case there ever was a fire that we understood what, the protocol was and what do we need to do i call it in the war room everybody knows what the war room is if you've been under scrutiny in this area and by law in ontario at least you have to run fire drills so i encourage mining companies to kind of get people thinking about that because you know it's about your ventilation network where is the equipment what battery chemistry so when i joined macasa there was a lot of unanswered questions we ended up putting a lot of pieces of the puzzle together it wasn't perfect but I'll tell you, the learning was quick. And uh, in this scenario here, um, we went through about 45 minutes. Everybody was safe. Then the mine manager leaned over to me. He says, hey, Mike, it was just a prototype. Uh, we just wanted to see how you were thinking and how you would execute on a, on a fire. So let me tell you, I had a couple of shot of whiskey, went back to bed and back to work the next day. OK, so back to uh, what's really important, production, you know, again, Battery electric vehicles, this is uh, just an A4. It's in an upper stope on 3400 level. Um, the first actually machine that actually went to Mikasa, um, it, it's, um, it was one of the prototypes. 
you know, again, I was always looking at, did we work safe? Did we achieve the target for the shift? You know, keeping in mind the grade, obviously production, the mining zone, the utilization and availability of the equipment, the maintenance scheduling and planning, as you've seen OEMs that are talking today and many more that are not on the panel here, they have the ability to manage and maintain their battery uh, performance. And also they have the battery, they have the ability, availability to actually uh, report on what's happening inside the battery subject that there is a internet connection in, at the charger or when they plug in or if they have wi-fi depending on the network the way it's set up so most of the mines are in good shape uh, there's another alternative that you can use the typical usb and plug in and dump the data and come to surface and actually read the data the beauty about that is the oems provide great great reports and feedback, but who does what with the report and what do they do for the decision making? From experience, and some are getting better from an operation standpoint, it goes into this big data room and gets collected, but really does people really analyze it and understand it? Do they understand what codes and what the codes mean and to that specific OEM? So there's some work to be done in that section of the industry, and I highly encourage all the mining clients when we and the OEMs to really push on that because it could be better to making decisions. For example, what's the charge? Is your battery ready? Is it, you know, is it overheating? What's the ambient temperature in that area? Is it, you know, is it actually depleting while it's sitting or where is it sitting in the operations? So there's a lot going on there in that section. Construction and execution. This is the biggest thing, setting up the battery charge bays and also, you know, making sure that you have the proper setup, as example, fire suppression system, either in the battery or on the machine. To date, that I'm aware of, the MLL, Ministry of, of, uh, of Labor, I believe there is no, and somebody can correct me, there is no protocol on bar battery charging station. There's reference to a fuel station, but there is, it's a difference Fuel and, and batteries are completely different and they're managed different. So um, I don't want to get into that debate on this call, but again, uh, from what I know and from the research that I've done, I believe there's nothing on that. However, on that, when I was at Macasa several times, we had the MOL come underground and they wanted to shut down the battery bays because we didn't have a fire rated door. Um, unfortunately, in the green book, there is no fire rated door that says that you shall or you must do that. So um, I had enough experience in operations at the time. And during our time at Macasa, we had battery fire suppression system in the battery as well as on the machine. And depending on what charging uh, bay, we would potentially set that up for a fire suppression system on the wall just for, for a peace of mind more than anything. Then the next thing is in a maintenance shop, we would do the same. So those were all the things. So my point to that is that it continues to evolve and expand. I talked about the main uh, maintenance program. This is critical. You know, um, data collection is great and understanding the battery and the chemistry. And you can see the red lines here. Um, that's just different within the cells. Every OEM has a different platform and a different look and feel but we can tell what's happening within the battery or what's in the cell. So we can early detect if there's something that's gonna go wrong with the battery. Now, again, it comes down to communication technology and then it also comes down to what's a priority for you in your operations to understand, you know, what does that look like? So there's a lot of moving parts here. The one thing I wanna really mention here is um, the PPE for high and low voltage, you know, uh, both OEMs today that, that presented, they talked about, you know, high voltage and uh, low voltage and, you know, DC versus AC. So, you know, having the proper um, PPE is critical as you manage the battery and the lockout uh, procedure. Of course, you got the 24 volt, which is the master, then you have high voltage. So depending again on what OEM, the way it's designed and the mm -hmm. lockout procedure is going to be very, very critical to understand. Then, you know, setting up your shop and satellite facilities. I could tell you when I landed at Mikasa in 2017, 2018, we were dealing with an old infrastructure. Today, we have the ability to lay out the mine design and the plan 
to take care of, you know, where do we want to actually do for the most part, where we want to be able to put the facilities, where's the logistics, where's the best part place to charge, you know, how do we manage the batteries, what does the shop look like? So also a big part of this is how do we take advantage of regen when batteries, because no different than, uh, you know, when we go uphill, obviously we're consuming energy, but when we go down, great, we can take an opportunity to send that energy back into the batteries. And every OEM will tell you that, you know, but understanding the mine plan, even with a little percentage of grade that can make an impact, it can get you that extra bucket of ore or waste or, you know, moving your screen somewhere to one side of the mine to the other. So mine design. And when I talk about all these scenarios, folks, please bear in mind, think about safety for each every one of these bullets because safety is impacted in every one. Mine design is a major one. Power and infrastructure validation. You know, how does that, what does that look like? Ventilation design criteria. I talked about regenerative braking. Standardizing and charging methodology is a major one. And I'm a strong believer on that one. I practice what I preach because we, we don't want three, four different, different charging methodologies because it becomes confusing and challenging and extra costs for the operation. IT communication and reporting, you know, depending on the level of the mine, if it's a junior, mid-tier, or, you know, a major, will be able to say what they want to communicate and how they want to communicate. They can, there's different ways. There's leaker feeder, there's LTE, uh, there's Wi-Fi, there's different, there's different scenarios, but this is critical backbone and infrastructure for success of the battery electric vehicles and also for the OEMs because when the OEMs are troubleshooting, sometimes they're sitting in their office. They can be sitting like me remotely somewhere in the world um, because that's part of their service contract. So it's very, very critical that the operations set up the, the backbone, I call it, or the infrastructure to allow communication and troubleshooting because there will be problems with your equipment. There's problems with diesel. There's problems all the time underground but it's how do we solve them and how do we manage them is really the most important part of it. Logistics and traffic management. You know, this was a big one for me learning. Um, again, I was dealing with a major old mine that's been around for a long time. And uh, we had to kind of, we, we, we wouldn't get to the face or to the production stope you know, we lost two, three hours. So this was one of the things that I really spent a lot of time and effort in traffic management and trucks always had the, uh, in this case, trucks always had the right of way, everybody off the ramp. Of course, when it came to um, moving material, we were looking for 2000 tons a day on average, which mostly we achieved. And we had very much success in 2017, 2018, 2019. But my point to this is uh, don't underestimate logistics and traffic management, including when you get off the shaft or you're going down the ramp, because this could be a major impact to your overall production. Charging methodology, as I mentioned, I'm not going to talk about OEMs, but we, there's many more here that uh, we can add. But I just want to give everybody, there's different strategies, different uh, processes. you got the onboard, the offboard, you got the swapping opportunity, I call the centralized charging. You, you heard some people talk about today, uh, you know, the CCS2 plug. Uh, industry, some of them are moving towards the CCS1 plug. All that means, then after some are going to a centralized charging philosophy. And that all depends on the people at the mine and the way they, and the equipment they're selecting. So um, gave a couple examples of a couple charge bays, uh, just for reference for the group here. Um, you know, for the top two, you got the swap on the on the top and you got the, the crane pull out and, and, and swap there too as well for the second and after obviously the third is plugging into mine power. So some of the lessons learned is uh, business case uh, stakeholder engagement, you know, that's really, really critical. Again, uh, as I mentioned in the start of the, the presentation, I don't sell equipment and uh, uh, I've been there, done that, built it. Uh, it was a great journey, but now it's the next level of how do we get this implemented and successfully to give people confidence and, you know, and we continue to grow battery electric vehicles in the operating mind where it businessly makes sense in certain areas. 
you know, understanding the equipment design and functionality. I think the OEMs that presented today and others that are in the room um, and also online do a great job now sharing their knowledge, their experience from an electrical standpoint to, um, you know, from a maintenance standpoint. But it's having the people that are actually going to use it day in, day out, understand it. It's great that we we uh, we have these nice books and all this information. But if people don't implement or execute, that information gets lost. And it's unfortunate, but that where that's when where the risk and hazards become very, very important. And I use the example of high voltage, understanding what you're dealing with, because now we're not dealing with the typical diesel convention engine we're dealing with electric power so with high voltage anything orange don't touch unless you understand what you you're doing that's high voltage so the mine design and charging methodology to soon the mining method of course i'm not going to reiterate but i think the fourth bullet here i think everybody knows that and we need to continue the only thing i'll say is that the colleges and the universities and wsn and everybody in the industry can continue to put on these workshops and continue to put on these programs, but we need buy-in from everybody. And we need people to behave and continue to promote, to send people to those programs because otherwise they will not survive. And that's really the critical part. The challenge for the colleges and the university and others is that we have the competent and expertise available to teach the outline and execution of this. And that's become a very, very big challenge because there's not many people that understand battery electric vehicles in detail around the world. There's probably, I would, I don't know what the number is, but there's probably 20 to 30 people that can really speak to it. And after others are either learning or they're reading. So the best way by learning is get underground and put your boots on and, and go see it and touch it and feel it. And then basically potentially operate it if you can, because that's really where you get the, the real experience. Then the next thing is collect, data collection and reporting, you know, lots of our clients, you know, they, I've seen them, they, they implemented, we've done, we do tons of peer reviews. And one of the things is, well, we want to get better at battery electric vehicles, but they don't have any data, but the vehicles have been underground for a while. And with all due respect, I don't blame the OEMs because I blame the mining clients because we need to be able to extract that data so we can understand what the performance is, then work with the OEMs to help them to make sure that we continue to refine and help develop the technology, but also maybe the parts and the components. Just like I mentioned in the start, when we brought Rosie Underground in 2018, four years later, he's gone, and but the technology has changed and the the outlook has changed. So that's why it's very, very important that we stay on top of it. Then the big thing I always continue to say is operational readiness and risk mitigation is the most critical part of the whole battery electric vehicle, safe handling, training, and mine rescue. And I will continue to emphasize as long as I'm alive <laughs> to on mine rescue and continue to push to run scenarios on battery electric vehicles. And I hope to God that never again there, there's a uh, mining fire in battery electric vehicles, but let's be honest with all ourselves. The increase of battery technology and equipment is getting higher. So if the higher the volume and numbers, the higher the risk is going to become. So I'm not saying it's going to happen, but let's be prepared as a group, as a team, as a industry to make sure that we train our people at the mine, within our management, within the mine rescues around the world, and WSN does a great job with this, to continue to be aware of the changing technology, the battery chemistry. Andy mentioned Tesla today. It was, it was interesting, nickel, cobalt, aluminum. I have a Tesla and fires. I agree with Andy's statement. A lot of, we only see the bad, we never see the good. So this is where industry needs to understand, yes, there's a lot of similarities with automotive, but underground and, and surface and even automotive is completely different. So let's not get skewed that batteries are dangerous in underground mining. They're safe, and I'll talk about safety. However, they need to be managed, they need to be understood, and they also need to be you know, making sure that people continue to do the right things and follow the proper procedures. So a lot of people ask me about, you know, okay, Mike, 
give me some some factual data. So this is a combined factual data about battery electric versus BV as uh, versus diesel. So just on average, you know, and the numbers can change depending on how we round. But in the same scenario, in the same location, in the same mine, same mining, the, the same operators, the same shift. And I was underground several times for this. I usually do this myself because I'm a person that likes to see, touch, and feel. I love to read the data management information, but I like to see the factuals. And I run a spreadsheet underground too. And then we do the analysis. And we took out, just for everybody's reason for this, we took out the anomalies like coffee break or you know stops or traffic and everything. So on average, this is kind of the results that we come out with. And it continues to evolve. But you can see that it's eight to five percent faster during the mucking cycle. We're doing production. We're going to continue to do um, utility equipment over time. There's another study that I'm actually embarking in, and then we're going to get into that too as well. Um, but this case here, it's on an LHD, then an LHD in trucks. Sorry. Then also too is 15% uh, more carrying capacity. What that means is that it can go faster, but also can carry more tons because it does more trips even incorporating the battery charging on this OEM. So it's pretty interesting results. Then the big thing, temperature rises. You know, we talk about safety again, why the purpose we're having this conference. You know, the temperature rise in diesel, and you know, when we're running and operating diesel equipment, it's four to 4.7 times greater versus the battery electric vehicles. Notwithstanding the noise where Nicole gets involved in the cab where She's always talking about, you know, what is it doing to the impact about, you know, your noise reduction and then the noise externally. So for those that know battery electric vehicle versus diesel, you know, when you got a diesel, you got to put your earmuffs on. You should have your earmuffs on all the time, but realistically, that doesn't happen. But when you have a battery electric vehicle running in the operation, the only thing you really hear is the pumps starting off. And we can have a conversation just like what we're having today. So that's kind of some of the thing. So I'm getting to the last couple of slides here. Um, you know, operational readiness, as I mentioned in the out, outset of the presentation, um, buying the equipment is the easy part, you know, and it's not about uh, calling it easy. There's obviously a criteria to go through, making sure that, you know, we have the right OEM for the right application, you know, the right partner. I like to call it partners. That's really and critical and important. As uh, you get you embark into battery electric vehicles, it's not a us and them. If that's what's going to happen, I'm going to tell you, you're going to have some challenges in the implementation. You know, I encourage people to get involved as a partner, and I call it pain share, gain share. We learn together, we report together, we win together. If there's problems or opportunities, we help each other to be successful. I just put together here just kind of a, a chart just to kind of go through a commissioning. I mean, operations, we're heavily involved in some implementation as we speak right now with clients in, on a global place, on a global basis in Latin America and also in North America, hence the reason I'm in Florida. But just kind of a, a process that you can go through and say, okay, you know, we gave the PO to the OEM, you know, what's the design criteria? What are the specs at the mine? Does it meet all the requirements? What are the drawings? What does it look like? What's the battery chemistry and so on? Then, you know, before it gets to site, we sign off and we commission it. Uh, that's highly recommended because what happens in, depending on the shaft or the ramp, maybe that machine needs to be re torn down again and brought down to a level then have to reassemble the underground. So there's, there's some steps there. Then also to thinking about, you know, how does it get down the shaft? And some of the equipment's quite big, so we got to cut the equipment and three places like a box on a truck, depending on the size of the shaft. So then after that, we go through the whole process. And again, there's more steps here so people can add. But my point to this slide is to get people thinking on all these scenarios along the way in preparation of your battery implementation and execution. And again, looking back and knowing what I know today, I probably would have locked out a pile of piece of equipment at Mikasa, but again, um, and the only reason I say that, folks, is because one, we didn't have the operating material or we didn't have uh, the maintenance or we didn't have the policy or whatever it is. You know, thankfully, during my tenure, nobody got hurt. 
um, we manage the risk, you know, but I look back, there was always things that I said, oh, geez, I could have done things a lot better. And that's part of growing and learning. So the question I asked the mining companies, you know, OEMs, industry, are we ready? You know, um, are you ready for battery electric vehicles? And you can apply this to diesel as well. It doesn't matter. But I mean, again, from my perspective, I go back to health and safety. Why we're here again today is if we can eliminate battery, uh, diesel equipment underground, uh, the black smoke, the DPMs, you know, the dust, the noise, and implement battery technology, at least if it meets and exceeds the, the production profile from a safety standpoint, and we can keep workers enjoying mining instead of, you know, hating mining and educate them that battery technology can be run from surface. There's some great jobs out there from, you know, maintenance and operations, then after also from technology with the OEMs that we can make a shift in this industry together collectively from, from either government, either OEMs, mining companies and industry experts. So I leave you with this conclusion and we'll open it up for uh, questions and answers. Um, I'll put my email in, uh, in, in the chat so that if people want to reach out directly, I would, you know, just please out of respect out of uh, WSN, I would appreciate you copy WSN because I was privileged enough to speak to this conference and I would like them to be involved uh, and work in a collaborative manner. But uh, I always say BEV technology is forever changing and we must implement training. Again, the training work, manage risks and apply best practices by engaging key stakeholders within your mining operation. So who is it all hitting in your operation? By partnering with OEMs and qualified industry experts, we will ensure a smooth operational readiness program and a successful implementation at site. Thank you very much. And that's it. All right, thanks. Uh, we'll start here with uh, in the room if there's any questions for Mike before we go online. So we have one here, so maybe you can speak loud so you can capture them. Are you able to hear me, Mike? Yeah, I can hear you. Uh, so in your experience, um, have you identified like a methodology? You talked about the charging stations. Um, and um, you know, suiting the mine method, or you know, looking at kind of different site levels. But um, have you identified like a best practice or best methodology for for charging? Yeah, it's a it's a tricky question, and I'll tell you why. It depends on the mining method. Uh, everything is driven by the mining method, and you know, the production rate. I you know, before I even look at strategy of equipment and even uh, um, charging. Got to look at what's the life of mine plan. There's there's a little bit of analysis and engineering that has to be done in advance because <laughs> the charging could be different in a base metal versus a uh, precious metal or even in a potash. Because and the reason I say that is because potash you're going for miles, right? Um, depending on you know are you hauling from a, a stope an open stope where there's no trucking and you're dumping down the Grizzly or an ore pass, or are you trucking up, or are you trucking down? So um, to answer your question, that's really where the main driver is, is in the engineering, your production profile, what does that look like? Then after I work backwards on, okay, well, what equipment fits that production profile based on the ore body? You know, obviously, um, is, it, is it a shallow, is it deep, is it uh, cut and fill, is it long hole? So we're getting very, very technical here. And I know I'm probably dancing around your 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 question, but that kind of comes a little bit later for me in uh, in in the process. But uh, on the charging methodology, as I mentioned, there's a swapping concept, as you know, and there's also a um, onboard charging where you can drive to the uh, drive to the plug and charge. Then you have the ability, obviously, to remove it. So it all depends on the operation and the way they think and the way they see their execution happening. Some like better the methodology of swapping. Then on the flip side, some want to be a plug and play. You know, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages. Here's the advantages and here's the disadvantages. And I hope I answer your question. In the swapping concept, you drop the battery, you back off on a tramming pack, you pick up the other battery, plus or minus practically is 10 to 15 minutes. However, however, I seen it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we're seeing now three to five minutes swap in, in that area. Now, 
let's flip the page on a, a onboard. You know, the board, you go to an onboard charging, you got to plug into Mind Power or to the OEM specific charger, and the machine is stuck to the to the um, to the grid because it can't go anywhere until it charges, unless you swap it with the crane and you pull it out and you try and battery. So that could take anywhere from seven to ten to fifteen minutes. So again, and then then you got others such as you know utility equipment where you know you plug in and you wait. So it's about balancing your your charging methodology and strategy, but also understanding what is your key fundamentals in the mine that's actually running your production. Let's face it, production equipment is priority for, well, you need drilling first, then you need you need to muck, uh, drill blast, then after you gotta be able to move the materials. So you gotta, it's all included in part of the package. So um, I get asked all the time, what's the best, either what's your preference? Well, it all depends on the mine. It all depends on the application and it all depends on the life of mine plan because infrastructure costs a lot of money. Cost per meter costs a lot of money. So there's advantages and disadvantages for both. But at the end of the day, um, you got to land on one. And I always try to coach our clients a standardized charging philosophy and methodology. That's what I really push on because I what I want to make sure is that it's set up in the right location. And for me, it's obviously having people come to the work location making sure the equipment's ready and available, like some of the OEMs are talking about, 80 to 95% availability. That's a win in my world because now the equipment's ready to go to work. I can go muck the face uh, quick and I can get uh, my production. Then after I can charge and I can do other things while we're waiting for the next round or go to another stove. So long-winded, I hope I answered it, but it's, it's all depending on mining method. Fair enough, thank you. So we have uh, one from online, uh, Mike. Hi, Mike. And um, so I'm looking at the Q&A chat. If you want to go and take a look there, there is one question. It's like multi-part. So um, they say, no doubt BEVs are the future of mining industry. Is the mining industry ready for this change? Does this uh, directly affect the way mine design will need to change soon? And then there's a whole list of <laughs> uh, some other topics there, but... Uh, I'll let you address what you'd like to address. Yeah. Um, so are we ready? Yeah, we're ready. Of course we're ready. We've been 12 years young, you know, in this in this business. You know, um, Borden took the the leap of faith. Mikasa, you know, again, I, I go back to really where did it start? It started 12, 13 years ago uh, with uh, a guy by the name of Brian Hinchcliffe and Rick Lemieux from RDH. Like, those are the guys are the pioneers that actually believed in the system because they had a need to either invest in a cooling system and or go battery electric. And that's how it really evolved over time. And, you know, many OEMs were part of that. So um, the question, Gabby, I mean, it's, it's, it's a generic question. The mines are ready for it. Um, you know, it all depends on the decision from corporate really that comes down to that. What they want to do, is it a sustainability? Is it a vent problem? You know, like the Sudbury mines specifically, it's hot, right? You get below anywhere six, 7,000 feet, 8,000 feet, we're getting hot. So we have to either invest in the cooling system, which is possible, or you invest in battery electric vehicles. So um, yeah, I mean, it's ready. The technology's evolved from where it was four years ago or even 12 years ago when I started to even dip my toes into this and where it is today. It's really, really, really exciting. And again, you know, I don't get no commission from the, the OEMs. Uh, I wish I did, but I don't. Um, but I could tell you, they're evolving, they're growing, they're, they're learning, uh, they're taking on more, um, more technology without jeopardizing the safety and the risk for the most part. We don't have these one-ofs that pop up like we used to have. Now they're, they're the big players or they're well-recognized with a reputation that has good head on our shoulder and management that are actually leading that performance in that area from, for the most part, there's always going to be one or two entrepreneurs that are going to pull in and they're going to pull a machine up and we'll, we'll see it make a shift in the industry. But for the most part, uh, I think uh, it's exciting where it's heading. And, you know, some people just need to decide if they want to do it or not. And there is a, a CapEx increase, no doubt. 
But there's also an OPEX, which is or a SUSEX, what we call, or depending on who you are and what you are in the, in the business, there is some definitely some reduction along the way. And I know because I do the numbers. I play with the numbers every day. That's the world I live in. So, you know, it, again, the life of mine plan, the mining method, you know, what does that look like? What's your management strategy in GHG? Um, you know, what's the purpose? And what's the life of mine plan is a critical part of the decision making when it comes to battery electric vehicles. Typically, if it's anything, uh, you know, short term, it, it just the business case just doesn't uh, sustain. And as much as I love battery electric vehicles, I had to tell one client specifically and it broke my heart. But, you know, I think honesty is the best thing to do is that uh, he had a life of mine plan of five years. And I had to tell the client, I'm sorry, BEV just doesn't make sense for two reasons. One, infrastructure and location. And two, your life of mine plan just doesn't justify. Go get some more definition drilling and reserves and resources and indicated, and then we can talk again and I would recommend it. But again, I'm not going to tell somebody that I don't, if I don't believe in it, it's not worth doing. So we have another question in-house, uh, Mike. Uh, Mike Sankep here. Uh, quick question when you say uh, mines are ready. I just want to ask a few questions. I don't know how to ask that question, so I think I'm going to elaborate a little bit more. So let's say, um, are we ready with the power infrastructure for brownfield projects and when we are going to green ore bodies? So let's say grade in phase five, are we ready with the electrical infrastructure? Or like often we ask ourselves if we have enough power around infrastructure, like where it's coming to the mine, right? So yeah. do you see yeah. the pattern somewhere with your other clients, not just Sudbury region, other region as well? What are your inputs in power infrastructure particularly? And are we ready for that power needs? Yeah. Uh, Is that you, Sackett? okay yes so are we ready yes um the question is everybody puts the cart before the horse so in this example i'm not saying in your specific example but in industry we get excited about this battery technology we go out and do some studies and we actually get people involved and one important element that becomes number one number one question Where's the power coming from? And do we have enough power to sustain a battery electric vehicle, right? And uh, so my point to all that is that, you know, hiring the right people to do the right studies to understand, do we have the power to do what we want to do? That's number one. Either are we working on a gen set or are we working on grid or what's our power consumption in that space? That's, that's kind of this typical because you know you have fans you have hoist you have chargers uh, you have all kinds of infrastructure related power requirements that to operate a mine so the mines need to understand that then the second thing is understanding what the output of the equipment selection they're taking can it adapt to the existing infrastructure that they have and some companies you know uh, learned unfortunately the hard way that they bought the machine and they went out and you know ordered it and brought it to figure out that you know they don't have the capabilities so i guess my point to all that question is that you know plan accordingly understand all the key criteria that need to be part of the evaluation in the desktop study take it to feasibility study where you start to select the equipment and you start to narrow in on your oems then you start to go look at mining, obviously mining method and, and all that's happening in the same time. Then when you get into execution, that should never happen. Like there shouldn't be a machine that arrives on site uh, that, um, that we don't have enough power. If that does happen in today's world, it's shame on the OEM and shame on the client, to be quite honest with you. Or even the engineering firm did not do their homework properly. So I know it sounds harsh. But I'm a straight shooter, and I mean, we need to understand what are the impacts. Diesel is a completely different beast because now we got to distribute fuel, fuel down the shaft, or we put a, a slick line or a bore line and we push fuel down. So those are different criteria. So now we got to think a little bit different at the outset. I hope that helps. Not sure if it does, but uh, be more than happy to have that discussion. But 
I believe, regardless if it's a brownfield, greenfield, every mine could adapt. It's just a matter of where and does it make sense? That's the other question. I'm not saying again, it's works. And the last thing I'll mention on that comment, it's about adaptability at operations. People do not like new technology. They're getting better. But in certain cases, I see machines sitting underground and I just shake my head. The company spent millions of dollars to buy that equipment and commit to it and they're not making it work. So again, it comes down to a focus. It comes down to how do we make it work? I'll tell you, it wasn't easy at Macassa. I had 42 of the suckers running around, but we made it work. We had good availability. It wasn't perfect. Our OEM supported us. We worked together and you know what? We achieved what we were supposed to achieve, which is one safety and two safe production. But um, another question, so. Yeah, we have two sort of similar online. Um, so someone's asking, to your knowledge, is there anywhere else in the world that has changed their ventilation requirements in their mining regulations to allow benefits of reduced ventilation due to the use of BEV? And then there's also another question that's in the, the chat box, so it's separate. Um, asking like a similar thing, is there anywhere else that you're aware of that has developed and implemented regulations or laws for BEV uh, that cover the needs uh, for health and safety of workers? Yeah, okay, so there's two questions. I'll answer one, uh, Gabby. The one on ventilation, yes, there's mining companies that actually we did some peer review and we selected different size of equipment, same OEM, Different size of equipment because we went definitely, we went from diesel to, to battery electric. We reduced the drift size. So if you think about this, for those that want uh, numbers, on average, it's $3,500 $3, Canadian, not US. We got to convert that because, uh, but I mean, $3,500 plus or minus, and you can check with the local contract is or, or $4,000 or $5,000, depending on who you do, per meter cut in development. What that means is there's a major cost. So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, there was a reduction by going with battery electric vehicle. We decrease our size of ventilation. We decrease our size of, uh, of headings. And we also decreased the size of the equipment, which was a big win, which the impact on NPV or net present value or NPC, net present cost, was drastic where it makes the economics make sense now. So that was the answer for that. It doesn't happen in all cases, but specifically in one of my projects that I just finished, that happened. Um, the second question, I think, was on battery uh, safety and environment. Is that correct, Gabby? Um, I'll, I'll sorry, I'll repeat it. A, uh, are you aware of a location that has developed and implemented regulations or laws mm. for BEV being used in mines that you feel cover all the bases for the safety of workers? Yeah, so... Um, there's several mining companies, obviously, they're taking best practices either from WSN or G uh, GMG, or there's a workshop out of uh, Australia, and there's different workshops around the world. Um, but yeah, I don't get too much involved in that, Gabby. I get involved with the implementation and the execution and the data collection and the safe operating procedures with the clients that we're working with around the globe. Um, is there a standard out there that you can cut and paste? To my knowledge, uh, you know, it's all over and the industry and it's not brought together where somebody's just sharing the best practices. GMG is a great one. I was part of the third one. They executed and finished that one. Um, but it's it's a guideline. You know, again, it's not a it's not you shall do this. So it comes with experience and it comes with, you know, having the right people doing the execution. And again, I always say, you know, the equipment. You hear this story all the time from me, and my Carter he drives him crazy. Find the equipment's easy. It's the execution and implementing and staying on top of the and, and reporting and, you know, driving and making sure that it's successful because that's what's going to really be the driver. And then sharing and elaborating in these conferences is critical to the success of the implementation. I can tell you, as soon as we get off the phone, we're going to learn something new. I think uh, we have one question. Here, so you're hard right. on me. Yeah. So one, one, one more, and I'll be, I'll be it. Well, it's all good. Just, uh, with the 
with a lot of people going towards battery vehicles and of course a lot of electric cars and everything else coming out, is this going to put a huge strain on the grid? And if it is, are our power generation companies ready for it? Because if we're not going to be using clean energy, it kind of neutralizes the gains. Yeah, there's different perspectives on that. I'm no industry expert from uh, when it comes to power on the grid around the world. But here's what I can say and I recognize, right? Because I see the data from the operations. You know, either it could be, doesn't matter what client around the world. Um, and it depends if the power is coming in by clean power or some other source of energy, for example, diesel generators or what. So to answer your question specifically, I mean, yeah, I think there's going to be more demand on the grid on a global basis, but it's only going to be in certain areas. I think my gut tells me there's going to be a bigger demand on uh, the automotive industry because they are producing cars at a fierce rate right now. And the biggest challenge, maybe not in the United States, because everywhere you go is almost there's a charger. But if you look at Northern Ontario, where you folks are, and I am, I had to build a off-grid five kilowatt system to keep my car charged. So I had to take matters in my own hand to be able to charge, or I drive to the South End and go for uh, you know, a haircut and maybe uh, an A&W and charge at the Tesla charger. But to answer your question specifically, I foresee, and again, I'm no fortune teller, but infrastructure is going to be a major demand uh, for battery electric vehicles on surface. And hence the reason I continue to push our local government anytime they call me and ask me, what's what do we need to do? Well, implement. That's what you need to do, including in Sudbury. And I mean, you know what? Bring the, the infrastructure around. So Sudbury, I'll, I'll just narrow in in that section. You know, there's three major mining companies that are producing, that are extracting tremendous amount of power. And, you know, not to talk about the universities and the and the in the uh, the colleges and et cetera. So understanding what the grid power is in that location or geographic space, then also adapting to it. Now, let me flip this to mining. For the most part, mining companies are advanced. They do in their homework and they understand where the power is coming in, either off the grid or on the grid. You know, either they have 13 kV coming down the shaft, and then after they have um, they have substations, and after that. so, for the most part, again, uh, I haven't seen yet a, a fatal flaw in the design, with the exception of learning <laughs> uh, that uh, along the way are catching, you know, maybe uh, I won't call it a mistake, an opportunity to continue to expand, is that you know they're set up underground. It's just a matter of how do they adapt and how do they implement the, the, the BEV? So long-winded question, good question. But my answer to that, from my end, it's going to be surface infrastructure that's going to be the biggest challenge. Underground, I think uh, we got enough smart people around the world that will be able to adapt in battery electric vehicle. My projection over the next five to seven years, yeah, the ministry or somebody's going to push a green initiative that you will not be able to operate if because because of the worker safety, you will not be able to operate if you don't go green. And I may be alive, I may be wrong, but that's just my projection. And I'm I'm good to quote that. Is it right, wrong? I don't know. We'll see. All right. Uh, thanks, uh, Mike, for your time. Appreciate it. Uh, your presentation. Uh, we do have uh, a gift bag for you. <laughs> um, so, so Paige and I volunteered yesterday. So maybe if you want to send an email to Mike and Paul, to yeah, the the country uh, to deliver it to you. So, <laughs> absolutely. And I think we should have the next WSN conference in Florida. It's beautiful. Perfect. I agree, hundred percent. So, thank you thank very much for your presentation. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Enjoyed it. Appreciate it. So folks, uh, we'll break for lunch.